This is Don Hollenbeck in the walled city of Troy. The following is an unofficial and unconfirmed report this ninth morning of the 40th year of the reign of King Priam and the 10th year of the war. According to the captain of the guard at the west gate, the Greek forces which have been besieging Troy for 10 years have vanished. We emphasize this report is unofficial and unconfirmed, but the captain of the guard says the Greek fleet has sailed and that as far as can be seen from the wall of Troy, the Greek camp has been completely abandoned. Also, the captain of the guard says that the image of a towering horse can be seen on the plain a few miles from shore. Again, we repeat, this report is without official confirmation, but the captain of the Trojan Guard is a reliable source of military information. There's every reason to believe that the report is trustworthy. 1184 B.C., the ancient city of Troy. You are there. A towering figure of a horse at the wall of Troy. Homer's Troy. History's Troy. The Troy of mingled fact and fancy. The epic moment when a proud but decadent civilization faced its destiny on the shores of the Aegean Sea. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. You are there. And now? 1184 B.C. Inside the walls of Troy with John Hollenbeck. The Greek forces have left the Trojan shore. A scouting party is even now somewhere on the plain outside Troy, trying to find out exactly what the Greeks are up to this time. John Daly is with that force, and we're awaiting word from him. We expect to have a report at any moment, and we'll stay on the air until we get that report. Quincy Howe has been assessing the implications and possibilities of the Greek evacuation, and he'll bring us up to date now. Is this the day for which Troy's national heroes and great warriors, led by Hector, have fought so valiantly and died? If it is, then the intolerable tension of the ten-year siege has ended. No longer will Trojans have to live behind their 30-foot wall, never venturing outside except at the risk of their lives. But there's a big if. Have the Greeks really gone for good? Or is this just another trick in the 10-year history of Greek treachery and deception? Remember that only three days ago in the last battle, Troy almost fell to Agamemnon, supreme commander of the Greek allied forces. It was another Greek trick engineered by their chief strategist, the Foxy Odysseus, who showed the Trojans something never seen before in war, something that might be called an armored force. Formations of Greeks, covered top, front, and sides with their shields, advanced to the very walls of Troy. Swords, spears, and arrows bounced off this armored monster until the last minute when Aeneas, the Trojan commander, son-in-law of King Priam, ordered a concentrated rain of heavy rocks. The big question now is, if the Greeks have gone, and it's not yet official that they have, we just don't know, the big question is, why, after this long, bitter attempt to overcome Troy, why have they suddenly quit? Have they... Just, just, just a moment. John Daly, who's with the scouting party out on the plane, is calling in by short way. The report that the Greeks have gone is true. The Greeks have gone. Not one of the 1,165 ships whose mass Troy has seen every morning for 10 years is here. The camps are deserted. Only abandoned barracks, rubbish, moldering fires, which apparently the Greeks set to destroy their equipment, remain. I can't describe what it feels like to stand out on this plain before Troy without fear of a Greek arrow. However, one very curious thing about this whole mystery is the strange reminder which the Greeks have left behind. A towering image of a horse. It stands 20 feet away, as close as the soldiers will permit me to go. We have to look up to see its head in the early morning light. It's taller, much taller than the 30-foot walls of Troy. Evidently, it's made of highly polished wood, intricately carved, and certainly a master craftsman must have designed and built this imposing and somewhat frightening figure now all alone on this plain of Troy where for so many years live horses and men with them have died. The Trojan scouting party I'm with is waiting for the arrival of King Priam's advisors. Patrols are scarring the hills and woods surrounding the plain, making sure there will be no ambush, although there seems little likelihood of that since the ships are gone. A group of chariots has come out of Troy. Here come the king's advisors. Yes, I can recognize the chariot of Aeneas, the tight-lipped commander-in-chief of all Trojan forces since the recent death of Hector. And there's the chariot of Cymetes, while personal advisor of the king, and... Oh, yes. Oh, 
They had one. The other states were the king's cabinet and self-appointed guardian of Troy's spiritual welfare is here, too. Their chariots are pulling up nearby. The captain of this scouting party has met them and as the king's advisors walk towards the monster figure of the wooden horse, the captain is rapidly explaining the sequence of events this morning. Aeneas, Dimitis, Laocoon are looking at the horse curiously. Aeneas seems puzzled. He keeps staring fixedly at the horse. Dimitis is smiling urbanely. Only Laocoon is shaking his head angrily and scowling, a mark of the old gentleman's crusty temper. Laocoon has just grabbed a spear from one of the soldiers. He's thrown it right into the horse. The spear is quivering in the flank. It made a sharp, hollow sound. The sun, now breaking through the early morning mist, has caught the spear and is dancing along its shaft. The sun also lights up the horse, and we see now that it has a golden bridle and reins with bridal ornaments in ivory dyed purple. The eyes of the horse are so realistically carved they seem to be staring watchfully at the walls of Troy three miles away. Aeneas, Laocoon, and Thymetes are talking heatedly now. There seems to be some disagreement, to put it mildly. Thymetes and Aeneas are practically dragging the old man away from the wooden horse. Thymetes is pointing in the direction of an abandoned Greek shelter right near here. They're coming this way now, apparently planning to talk things over inside that shelter. Aeneas is in the lead. Aeneas! Aeneas, sir, as commander-in-chief of the Trojan forces, what do you make of all this? I have nothing to say. Let me pass me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Laocoon! Laocoon! Sir, do you feel that the... Pres- we are being tricked. The Greeks have dug on the fleet. That's what, why I thought they were special to think. We have not seen the last of them. We have, we have. Thymetes, you must realize this is a trick. You must now, realize... please, Laocoon, we all know your solicitude for the good of Troy... But Aeneas and I... Aeneas have... and you burn the image, I say. Fill it full of spears. And I'll tell the king so too. And Laocoon, we're keeping our command. It's a trick. It's a cunning Thank you, gentlemen. Thymetes and Laocoon are by. entering the Greek oh, shelter. Oh, there oh, certainly oh, seems to be a division of opinion as to the exact meaning of what's going on. Laocoon seems to mistrust the whole business, particularly this big wooden horse here. I believe if he had another spear, he'd throw it into the horse himself. Thymetes, however, seems inclined to accept the evidence that the Greeks are gone. And as for Aeneas, the Trojan commander-in-chief, he, as usual, is noncommittal. We'll wait here until their conference is over. A patrol has just come up. They've got a prisoner, a Greek. They're hustling up, up to the captain who is standing right here. I can see the Greek now. Two husky soldiers have his arms pinned behind his back. He's a short man, blonde, as all Greeks are, unshaven. Young fellow is tuning his corn and dirty. over every foot of the Greek camp. He wasn't in the camp, sir. We found him in a clump of trees moving around while we were searching. Well, you better go out there and see there aren't any more. Take the prisoner inside. The captain Greek isn't wasting dog. any time questioning this Greek prisoner. Right. He's taking him right into the shelter where Aeneas, Thymetes, and Laocoon are conferring. The patrol is standing out again, going back to see if there are any more Greeks that may have been overlooked. Perhaps the capture of this Greek prisoner will prove to be the key to the mystery of the Greek evacuation. We'll have to wait for something official on this, but here's a message. Richard Hotlet with another Trojan detachment has reached the main Greek camp. He's ready with a report. Go ahead, Hotlet. gives one the strangest feeling to stand in this great deserted camp. For ten years, this has been the Greek arsenal for the siege of Troy. It's not a camp, it's a city, a neighboring city to Troy, about which Trojans have known almost nothing until today. Apparently, the Greeks tried to burn it down, but the fires were not very extensive. If the Greeks really meant to destroy this city camp, they didn't do very well. I'm standing in the huge main square, which evidently served as the meeting place for the Greeks. Streets run into this vast area from all directions. They're silent street now, but once they were thronged with military, slaves, animals, and women. Captive women picked up on islands in the Aegean and brought by the Greeks to serve them. The air is full of the smell of wild ginger, which grows in abundance on this coastal plain. Trojan women have been deprived of this source of perfume for ten years, but now they'll have it again. All around the square are the houses formerly occupied by Nestor, Achilles, and Agamemnon, Ajax, all the other Greek leaders. Attached to Achilles' house are barns and stables for supplies, chariot horses, and cattle. This camp, by the way, is right by the edge of the sea. The surf rolls in and the gulls are crying as they hover over the stone foundations which served as land bases for the Greek ships. The ships were lined up in rows facing Troy, and in front of them the Greeks threw up a high earthen wall with a moat. With a moat and watchtowers, but 
Now I've just received word that Aeneas, Primedes, and Laocoon, the king's advisors, have taken the mysterious Greek prisoner to King Priam's palace. John Daly is with them, so over to John Daly. I'm in an anteroom of King Priam's palace. The Greek prisoner was rushed here almost immediately after being questioned briefly on the Trojan plain. He has just been interrogated thoroughly by the king and his advisors, who are at this moment in conference. We've been given permission to interview the prisoner. He's here with me now under close guard. Guards are walking up and down. The prisoner has given his name as Sinon. It's a name that we don't recognize as being on the list of Greek warriors and heroes. Now, uh, uh, Sinon, uh, what did you tell the king? Have the Greeks left for good? I wouldn't have that information. I'm just a minor officer. I see. Uh, why were you left behind? I hid myself before the fleet left. Why? It's a long story. Well, we've got plenty of time. Tell it to us. Well, there's um, Odysseus. You probably heard of him. Yes, I've heard of him, but let's get that long story started. I had a little trouble with him. There was a disagreement. Something went wrong, and I was blamed. Well, go on. Well, people whom Odysseus dislikes have been known to disappear, or they've been found with a dagger in their backs. Yes? I thought I'd disappear without Odysseus' help. Oh, uh, why did the Greeks leave? I don't know. I'm just a minor officer. You, you must have some idea. It was said around the camp that we were going back to Greece for fresh supplies. Then the Greeks are coming back. It was said around the camp that once our commanders returned home, they'd remain there. Oh. Uh, well, uh, what's the story about the wooden horse? It was built for the goddess Athene. Well, why? What for? The oracles told our commanders that if they built a wooden horse, they'd have victory. If that's true, why did they leave the horse behind? It was too big to carry on a ship. Well, um, why not destroy it? Why leave it for the Trojans if, if, if it's an offering for victory? They didn't leave it for the Trojans. What do you mean? They built it so big... It can't be taken into the city. I see. Uh, well, what did the king say to you uh, when... Oh, just just a minute. I'm told that the conference between King Priam and his advisors has broken up. Ned Kalma is in the king's quarters, so over to him. Thymetes, Laocoon, and Aeneas are just coming out of the king's cedar line suite. Aeneas, Aeneas, sir. What did the king say? I have nothing to say. Nothing to say. Leakawan, if you please, sir, what did the king say? Is the war over? I say, Leakawan, sir, is the war over? What did the king say? I say the war is not over. I say the Greeks are coming back. What the king said. We must not demobilize. We must not relax for an instant. If we do, we are lost. Yes, I know, sir, but what does the king say? What does he think about the Greek prisoner, about the horse? He is not sure yet. He will not make a decision yet. But this I begged him to keep the city alert. That horse is a gift from the Greeks, and a Greek gift means death. Of course, sir, we will. We must be alert, I say, alert. I am going to the temple to pray the for the horse. They are going to Primetes, Primetes, sir, what is your view about all this? Well, it's very simple. As you heard, Lyakawan, in his praiseworthy zeal for Troy, argues that the Greeks are coming back. As for my part, I accept the evidence of my eyes and ears. I don't believe everything the Greek prisoner says, but I think we can safely assume that... His commanders have had enough of their unsuccessful siege of Troy. Then the war is officially over. Uh, not uh, quite. As Lyakawan said, the king has been unable to reach a final decision. He's still weighing an official declaration concerning the state of hostility. Well, then there are no plans for demobilization? Uh, not uh, immediately. And what about the wooden horse? Oh, that's really not important. I can't imagine why the Greeks did it. But we must admit it's a curiosity, a clever product of the woodworker's art. The king agreed that it might provide a welcome spectacle for the people every Trojan loved horses. We're bringing it into the city. 
But how can you do that, sir? I understood the Greeks had built the wooden horse so big that it couldn't be brought into the city. Oh, I'm afraid the Greeks were too clever this time. We're simply going to widen the gate. Oh. Thank you, Simiti. Not at all. Not to this reporter, at least, the situation is still rather confused. We don't know yet whether it's war or peace. However, there is in Troy at this time one Greek other than the captive Sinon. For a comment on this baffling situation, that other Greek is now waiting at a microphone with Ken Roberts. So, over to Ken Roberts. I'm speaking to you from the women's quarters of King Priam's Palace. Seated beside me is a beautiful woman. She is dressed in a long, frilled robe with a high, close body. At her shoulder, she wears a pin of Chinese jade. The air is scented with her perfume of rose oil. Her hair is blonde and elaborately coiffed. There can be only one such woman, the Princess Helen, formerly of Greece, lately of Troy. Permanently of Troy now, I hope. Does that mean then, Princess Helen, that you think your countrymen have finally given up their avowed purpose, never to return to Greece without you? Now, do you really think my countrymen, as you call them, came all the way to Troy to fight the greatest war of history just for me? Well, certainly your husband, Menelaus of Sparta, his brother, Agamemnon, and all the Greek commanders have been most vociferous in keeping alive the story that you are the cause of this war. That is romantic, isn't it? Helen eloped with Paris, Trojan prince. He takes her to Troy. Deserted husband rallies all of Greece. Launches a thousand ships. All to bring back a pretty face. Romantic, yes. In fact, idyllic. But in truth, rather foolish. Let's recognize it for what it really is. A convenient pretext on which to start the war. Well, Trojans have never heard your version of what this war is all about. I think it's quite simple. It's a matter of economics and rivalry between two powers. The Greeks are a virile, expanding people. They've outgrown their rocky, unproductive home. They need and want control of the Hellespont, the gateway to the inland sea and the riches of the east. One power stands in their way. Troy. Need I say more? Sounds reasonable. Do you think that their leaving means that they've finally given up their dream of world conquest? I wouldn't care to predict what a Greek will do. But I sincerely hope they're not coming back. I don't ever wish to leave Troy. I followed my heart to Troy. Troy is my home. The more so since my Paris died defending it. Thank you, Princess Helen. This is Ken Roberts. I return you to our studio. This is Quincy Howe. Priam has not yet decided whether to declare hostilities officially at an end. The old king is a tired, almost broken man who has lost all but one of his sons in this war. Now, this present lack of leadership, this indecision is doing Troy no good. It has complicated an already confused situation. If Laocoon, Troy's elder statesman, is right, and the city needs more alertness than ever, then every added moment of hesitation weakens morale. A growing body of public opinion, led by Thymetes, argues that this is indeed the end of the war. The time to demobilize, to cut wartime taxes, to lift controls and trade restrictions inside and outside Troy. All this eagerness for peace comes out in the reception given the wooden horse, which is now inside the city. Many Trojans agree with Thymetes that it's a victory trophy, and these people are trying to persuade others to share that view. Yet even while Laocoon prays in the temple, another prominent citizen is carrying a message of warning to the Trojan people. She is King Priam's daughter, Princess Cassandra, the strong-willed, social-minded reformer. At this moment, Princess Cassandra is in the main market square addressing the public. John Daly's there, too, so over to John Daly. crowd growing every minute. It seems as if every citizen of Troy is coming into this market square carrying torches. The people are listening quietly, intently. They seem unable to make up their minds. Let's listen. For years this man has been saying, appease, appease the Greeks, end the war at all costs, make peace with the Greeks, give them what they want, 
lie down and grovel before them on their path to world conquest. Oh, what an encounter us to accept the Greek of Martin before the war began. It was thy meeting. For oh, what? Once the war began, for men to accept the terms of Odysseus for a dishonorable peace. It was Thymedes, and I have reason to know that this same Thymedes has held secret meetings with the Greeks here inside Troy, while your sons and husbands on the plane out there were dying. Citizens of Troy, I tell you, the Greeks are coming back. Now is the time, if ever, for Trojans to double their guard and their vigilance. Now... This is Don Hollenbeck. We have interrupted the Princess Cassandra to announce the death of Laocoon. The elder statesman died under mysterious circumstances while praying in the temple of Poseidon. His two sons died with him. Authorities are investigating, and in the absence of an official explanation, wild rumors are beginning to circulate. The story is being spread that Laocoon and his sons were strangled by serpents. Other fantastic accounts are going the rounds, but more reliably... It is reported that Laocoon and his sons may have been murdered by unknown elements opposing his violent resistance to the declaration of peace. We'll bring you further news as it develops, but now back to John Daly in the Market Square. This is John Daly. The news of the death of Laocoon has already reached this square, and it's having an electrifying effect on this great crowd. Quiet just a few minutes ago, it has now come to life, and the men and women in it are turning to all sorts of celebrations. They're taking the death of Laocoon and his sons as a divine visitation, a punishment of the elder statesmen for opposing the party of peace. They're milling about the square, pushing and shoving, forming into groups of celebrants. Many of them have suddenly brought out goat skins of wine. Others are headed for the taverns and they're shouting, Peace, peace, the war is over. It looks as if the decision has been taken from King Priam's hands the decision which he was unable to make himself. The citizens of Troy, of Troy rather, have declared peace, and the gods help them if the decision is a wrong one. Still, there's no news here in the square as to what Aeneas, the commander... Oh, wait a minute. Ned Kelmer has some news at King Priam's palace. Go ahead, Kelmer. There are Greek soldiers inside Troy near the wall. Headquarters has just made this statement. Aeneas and Thymetes have left the palace with a body of troops. They're on their way to the wall. News of the Greeks' sudden appearance was brought to the palace by a wounded Trojan soldier. He was with the detachment on guard at the wooden horse. We've been promised more details as soon as possible. Couriers have been sent from the palace to all parts of the city to alert the populace and round up all troops. I repeat, there are Greek soldiers in Troy near the wall. This statement was made a short while ago here at King... This is Don Hollenbeck. John Daly is on his way with a mobile unit to the wall where the Greek soldiers have been reported seen. Richard Hartlett has taken over in the market square, so for the city's reaction to that news, we'll switch you there. Come in, Richard Hartlett. As far as we can tell, the reaction down here to the report that there are Greek soldiers in the city seems to be a mixture of disbelief and unconcern. The crowd, which began celebrating the end of the war when Laocoon's death was announced, has grown larger and even more exuberant. More and more soldiers have joined it without their arms. By the light of their moving torches, we can see the soldiers, arm in arm with the civilians, thronging the square and streaming in and out of the taverns around it. This cobbled square is littered with empty wineskins. The one sober, urgent note in all this rejoicing is the presence of the couriers from headquarters trying desperately to round up these celebrating troops for whatever action may be required. Soldier, soldier, wait a minute! <laughs> <laughs> no hurry, I'm not driving away. But aren't you on your way back to barracks? Where's your sword? Huh? Well, I need a sword for it. Never going back to the barracks. But your orders, this news about Greek soldiers in the city. Greek, Greek soldiers? Where? What? What? I didn't hear. There's been a report from the palace that there are Greek soldiers near the wall. The wall. Your commander-in-chief ordered huh? all troops on the alert. Thanks. Uh, I have to go to my barracks at once. I have to go to... Wait a minute. Aren't you going the wrong direction, soldier? Huh? Your barracks are this way. Well, that's, that's true. That's true. Uh, where did I leave my sword? I can't remember Ned Calmer at the palace has more details about the Greeks in the city, so come in, Ned Calmer. The Greeks in the city came from the wooden horse, which was hollow. As nearly as the wounded Trojan soldier could estimate, 
There were about 25 of them, and he thought he recognized Odysseus. In the darkness, the soldier said, the small Trojan detachment, which had been posted as a guard around the horse, was surprised and overcome. Everyone but this soldier killed without a chance of self-defense. The wounded man, left for dead, managed, however, to make his way to the palace. He said that when the Greeks had gone, he could see the hole in the belly of the horse through which the Greeks had crawled and a ladder down which they climbed to the ground. After killing the guards, the Greeks then made off in the direction of the wall. We don't know if this Trojan soldier is going to live or not, and we don't yet know the full implications of this. This is Don Holland Beckett News Headquarters. We've interrupted Ned Calmer because John Daly and a mobile unit has reached the wall. Go ahead, John Daly. Thousands of Greek soldiers are streaming across the plain from the beaches towards the walls of Troy. The plain is almost as light as day with the fires of Greek torches and beacons. The Greek host is pouring out of the Greek fleet, which has returned to the harbor in full strength. In the distance, the ships are being unloaded. In front of them, vast columns of troops are lining up, and nearer to us, the chariots are moving across the plain, moving closer and closer to the wall of Troy, waiting for them at the main gate of that wall 30 feet below, and not armed Trojans ready to die in bitter defense of their city, but instead Greeks, the small band of Greeks which came out of the belly of the wooden horse, who quickly overpowered the surprised and totally unprepared guard at the main gate, which had been widened to allow for the entrance of this great wooden horse. This small band is waiting now to march at the head of the oncoming Greek horde into the city. On our way to the wall from the city square, we heard repeatedly the story from civilians and soldiers alike that Aeneas has deserted, has fled the city, and that Simetes, the man who had cried, peace, peace, at any price, has taken over command to meet the Greek army, not in combat, but as an ally. There's one story that he's at this very moment with Odysseus at the main gate, and that Sinon, the mysterious prisoner, is with him also. All of which adds up to a picture which is becoming increasingly clear every passing moment as these Greek chariots come nearer and nearer the city gate of Troy, which is now open to receive them. This has been a plot, a cunning stratagem, conceived probably by Odysseus and cleverly carried out by Sinon, a plot which was flourished by Troy's fatal moments of indecision and its people's weariness of war and their unwillingness to listen to Laocoon and Cassandra. Now, below me, the first of the Greek chariots to reach the gate. There are some empty ones to accommodate the men from the wooden horse. They are getting into them, passing through the gate. The Greeks are now entering Troy in full force and so far not a sign of any Trojan defense. One can imagine how effective that defense will be with all of the city taken off guard, demoralized. And at the height of celebration, rejoicing. 1184 B.C. Troy takes a gift from the Greeks and dies. The Fall of Troy was broadcast originally by CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and came to you at this time as another program in the series You Are There. <laughs> There was a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.